Good morning and welcome back to the second day of the summer school here in Greenbank. So yesterday, as a recap, we talked about so many types of uh, telescopes. We talked about the differences between interferometers and single dishes and the benefits of single dishes versus interferometers in many instances. Um, we talked about the GBT in particular, some radio astronomy basics of radio telescopes. And we also had a science talk from Fred McGuire talking about astrochemistry and then spectral lines from Natalie Butterfield. Let's we'll continue on for Larry Morgan. Just a quick recap of yesterday. Today, I'm really happy to introduce you to Dr. Jay Lochman, who has uh, been with the observatory since the late 80s, early 90s. When they brought me each day from the orphanage. When they brought him from the orphanage, <laughs> and here he stayed. Uh, he was a former director of the observatory during the construction of the GBT. And he's going to be walking us through a little bit about the whole spectrum of radio astronomy from the past to the future. So take it away. Thanks. Uh, despite what the uh, title says here, this is a brand new talk that I've been working on over the weekend. And I even changed the ending. So um, it's interesting to me to think about uh, the history of radio astronomy, because other than the fact that it's a lot of fun to see all these amazingly colorful characters and their antics, um, a lot of what we can take for granted today about the world of science that we live in is actually quite contingent and could have gone very different ways. And in fact, there's a good chance that it will go very different ways in the future. So who here has seen the Barbie movie? Okay, right, I'm going to Wednesday. And, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, there's such huge publicity about it. Here's the thing that takes like hundreds of millions of dollars you get a fairly small group of people and they have this idea and they get a hundred million dollars somewhere to do it. And then it goes out in the world and we pay our money and it makes a billion dollars. Okay, very few movies do that. With radio telescopes, they, they each of them have a kind of colorful past, but these days it's almost equivalent to that. You've got to sell an idea on the national stage and really today on the international arena and the, start the ponderous mechanism of getting this sort of thing funded. And in the end, you know, somebody lights the fuse and web goes up and we all hope that it works. Um, there are some parallels with some very differences. You're not gonna make a penny off web really. Uh, it's not gonna pay back its investment in any tangible way except intellectually, which of course is why we're here. Um, this is, oh, by the way, once you leave here, you can keep in touch with what's happening at Green Bank. Every two weeks, we have a webinar and uh, where we present some science that uh, derives from the Green Bank Telescope. Um, and it's open to everybody. Uh, just look, it's on, I can't remember which Wednesday we're at right now. Um, but I think it's uh, next Wednesday, they'll be the first one. And it opens up with our director who's shown here preparing for one of these webinars. And he gives a, a few minutes update on what's happening here at Green Bank. So they're kind of interesting to stay in touch with the place. And before going on, I've heard about the talks that you've been given yesterday. And so I wanna challenge you with a question. Could you just consider the science that the uh, VLA does and the science that the Green Bank Telescope does in terms of proposal pressure, what's actually published. You will find that almost all the work on active galactic nuclei is done at the VLA, and almost all of the interstellar chemistry uses the GBT. I hope by the end of this week, you will understand why this is. And it has nothing to do with short spaces. Okay, um, just the fact of life of radio astronomy is that we live underneath this wonderful atmosphere. Um, and this is the opacity of the atmosphere here as a function of wavelength. And here's the radio astronomy band. You can do this from the ground. It makes a huge difference in terms of the cost of the instrumentation. You can also do optical astronomy from the ground. Now, a big difference between the optical window and the radio window, for one thing, is the size. The optical window is a factor of two in wavelength. The radio window is a factor of 10,000 or so in wavelength. And so, as a result, the radio window encompasses a huge variety of phenomena, things that were really unexpected before the uh, start of radio astronomy. And so you could be doing very different science in the millimeter than you were doing in the long meter wavelengths. Um, we have absorption from the atmosphere here. And so if you want to work up here, where there's a lot of interesting uh, science to be done, you need to get above most of the atmosphere, mountaintops or so on. 
Uh, down here, I'll talk about this a little bit later, the ionosphere boxes. Um, radio astronomy started with Carl Jansky, shown here in his Natty Knickers. He was a young uh, engineer that was hired by Bell Labs through a bit of nepotism. He failed the physical exam, but he had an uncle or something that was high up and they got him hired. And they, they asked him to do a project which involved transatlantic radio communications. In the late 20s, early 30s, there was a boom in transatlantic communications now, Bell Labs, which is the forefront of this. And the real question is, if you operated at these frequencies, what was the kind of interference that you were likely to see? And so Jansky, uh, with the help of some others, constructed this antenna, a replica of which is out in front of the Jansky lab. And it rotated around on these tires taken from a Model T Ford, I believe, and went around once every 10 or 15 minutes, I can't quite remember, scanning just above the horizon. And what he discovered was a lot of thunderstorm activity, as you could imagine, that produces a lot of radio signals. And let me just point out, this is at 14.6 meters, 20.5 megahertz, low frequencies by current standards. Um, but he also noticed a continuing signal that seemed to shift with the seasons, and he discovered radio emission from the Milky Way. It made the front page of the New York Times, new radio waves traced the center of the Milky Way. Um, direction is unchanging, more than a year, no evidence of interstellar signaling. And so this, of course, is the time of War of the Worlds and the thought that there was life on Mars and things like that. So it was really thought that there might be some intelligence behind this. Um, Jansky's experiment was quite interesting because if you draw this line here where his experiment was taking place, you see you're right at the edge of the ionosphere. And there are times when the ionosphere is transparent and there are times when the ionosphere is not transparent. Let's see what, I, yeah, here's a, here's a thing I just pulled out over the weekend. This is at five megahertz where the ionosphere is almost completely opaque all the time. But even here, there are huge variations in the terms, the absorptive terms in the ionosphere. There's a constant absorption which kills you at five megahertz. I think everywhere the earth. Um, and then this just shows a kind of diurnal variation in opacity. But the opacity is really huge and it depends on solar activity. And Jansky was very lucky in that he was observing during a time of minimum solar activity. So in fact, the ionosphere was transparent. Had he been working at another time, he, we would call the Jansky something else. Um, so here was the problem that Jansky's detection posed to the world of science. Everybody knew by this time, the 1930s, that objects radiate according to very simple laws, the Planck law, black body radiation, so ever. This is the radiation due to the thermal nature of, um, of, this is thermal radiation from everything that's due to its heat. And it follows this kind of curve. So here's frequency here. And um, this is room temperature here, peaks in the infrared. You get things hot enough and they will peak in the visible and the ultraviolet. And so, um, but there's, although everything does have a very long tail down to low frequencies, the intensity gets lower and lower and lower, which is, again, a background on, on this one particular fact. And you see how everything crashes at the higher frequencies very strongly. So, you know, you can do an experiment which tells you something very profound about the world we live in by simply being in a room turning off the lights. And, you know, you can impress your parents, skeptical cousins with this, you turn off the lights against dark. This is a very profound thing because it's telling us that the, te the temperature of the physical objects around us, they just do not radiate in the optical, right? 300K does not radiate in the optical. But if your eyes could pick up radio waves, it would be very bright indeed because everything that has any temperature above absolute zero radiates in the radio. But Jansky's detection was a problem because on this scale, Jansky was up here. All right, what in the world could be radiating so brightly at such a low frequency? Um, by and large, the astronomers didn't know what to make of this. 
Jansky was an engineer. The engineers didn't know what to make of it. They weren't astronomers. And so there was nobody really following up on Jansky's detection um, until Grote Reber came along. He was a young guy, just got his degree, um, living in Wheaton, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago in his mother's house. And he was very interested. He was working for General Electric, I think. He was very interested in Jansky's discovery. And he asked around and discovered that nobody was following it up. And so he decided he was going to follow up and see what Jansky had done using his own money on his own time. And he built this instrument. We still have this. It's out in front of the Science Center. We, and just to, this was from a local newspaper. What is it? All we ponders the purpose of the three-story mystery contraption erected by Peter Weaver. They got his name wrong. In his yard. He paid for all of the uh, construction materials. They were built to a size that was consistent with what was available from the hardware store. So no special pieces really. And he designed this and you can see in it all the elements of the modern protocol. He built, had to, all of his receiving equipment, all of his detecting equipment. And he understood enough physics to understand that if Jansky got a detection here, given the nature of these curves, he should look at as high a frequency as he could. And he did 3.3 gigahertz, extremely high frequency for the time, nothing. Well, he then went and rebuilt all his stuff. Here's another photograph of it. You see the picket fence back there? <laughs> this is a suburb. This is not a farm. This is right in the middle of all these houses. Um, he rebuilt his equipment, new receivers, new detectors for 900 megahertz, still nothing. And uh, Reber was coming here during summers for the, in the uh, last few years of his life, it was really quite a character. And he was recorded as saying that most people, this would have discouraged them. For him, it just encouraged him to, to keep going. What the heck was going on? Rebuilt all his equipment. There's pictures of the young Reber on the top and a view from Green Bank here. At 160 megahertz, 0.16 gigahertz, he finally got a detection. And this is so, shows some of his early uh, chart recordings as the Milky Way drifted by. All this hair that you see, the static, is ignitions from passing cars. So the very first radio astronomer got shut down in part by passing cars. He had to end up working mostly at night when there wasn't so much radio frequency interference. So here's the problem. This is the spectrum of what was discovered by the early radio astronomers a spectral index that is not thermal. And this picked up the very imaginative, I mean, that takes away my breath just to say it, non-thermal radiation. And these days we divide the world into thermal and non-thermal. The thermal was here first and all the physicists understood thermal. It was decades before people even understood the origin of this emission. Meanwhile, he <coughs> was mapping out the sky with his dish and he discovered this is, 160 megahertz, this is 440 megahertz. This is the Milky Way here. And huh, it was bright, but it didn't last long. Anyway, this is the Milky Way. And you can see how it's just weaker and more constrained at the higher frequencies, opposite the behavior anyone had a right to expect. There was a third pioneer of radio astronomy I'll talk about who came on the scene about the time Reber was publishing, and that's Ruby Payne Scott. She was working for um, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Organization in Australia. She was a graduate of the University of Sydney and was um, ranked, to, thought to be the best mathematical physicist in, oh, thank you. Best, best, <laughs> sorry. Do, do these people know what you're gonna do in a week or two? No. He is going up to Svalbard, Nialison to disassemble a, radio telescope and bring parts back while fending off polar bears. <laughs> this would be handy. Yeah. Ruby Payne Scott was thought to be the most brilliant mathematical physicist of her generation. And she was drawn into the World War II effort in Australia developing early radar systems. And here's one of the antennas that she was developing. And this shows their station outside Sydney Harbor uh, the harbor is the gap all the way to the top. You see a ship about to approach in there. Um, 
right when the war ended, they had this really smart team of physicists and uh, radio engineers uh, there working for the government. And so the, the, their lab head said, find something useful to do where you can use all these talents. So they turned to radio astronomy and began some of the very first work on radio emission from the sun. All of the signals you see here are not interference, but actually emission from the sun. So Ruby Payne, Scott and the gang found these interesting uh, events, highly polarized, indicating magnetic fields were involved and uh, were studying. So Ruby Payne Scott was the first female radio astronomer and one of the first astronomers in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the three of them had very different careers post-discovery. As I mentioned, Jansky was uh, never very healthy and he died in his early 40s before he could see radio astronomy take off as a, a complete field. It's generally allowed that had he lived, he would have gotten the Nobel Prize for his discovery. Reber lived into his 90s, a wonderful, cranky, crotchety old guy, moved to Tasmania where because of the ionosphere, he really wanted to do very low frequency astronomy because he thought that's where the action was, that's where the sky was brightest. Um, he hated big science. If the scientific community was going this direction, Grope would be off going in that direction. But it was really interesting to be around. Ruby Payne Scott had a very different ending to her career because around the time she got, was working with radar, she had done something that in the eyes of the Australian government was absolutely uh, forbidden, unimaginable. She got married. At that time, it was written that female employees of the Australian government forfeit their position upon marriage. And her colleagues covered up for her as long as they could, but some bureaucrat discovered it. And not only did she lose her job, but she lost her accumulated pension for the period when she had that. Uh, she was able to be hired on a part-time basis, but then left to have a child. And there was no real uh, accommodation for that in Australia in the 1950s. Um, Australia's tried to make up to that. You gotta give them credit. They have an now Ruby Payne Scott Fellowship to allow women to continue careers through life changes like childbirth and all. And the New York Times discovered a few years ago that its obituaries were dominated by white guys. And they started the series trying to make up for it. And so in 2018, they published an obit for Ruby Payne Scott. So we're looking um, it, as I said early on, it's worthwhile looking at the history of things to make you realize that what we take for granted for now was not necessarily always the way and may not necessarily always be the way. Okay, you know about spectral lines. I've been talking about continuum emission from thermal and from non-thermal sources. Of course, there's spectral lines. And here we turn to Jan Oort in the Netherlands, very distinguished astronomer, figured out the rotation of the galaxy, You've probably heard of the Oort cloud. He understood that in order to make sense of the Milky Way, you'd have to find a radio line in, I mean, a spectral line in the radio that wasn't blocked by dust. Because you could only see a small percentage of the Milky Way in the optical wavelengths because of dust. And so, due, because of a chance encounter with this guy, Hank van der Hulst, who was at that time hiding now, this took place during World War II in the Netherlands. It was occupied by the German army. Um, they started purging the University of Leiden of any faculty member with a Jewish background or who had sub uh, suspect political views. And so the faculty just resigned and went underground and were hid out in the countryside. Van der Hulst was a young man uh, hiding out in his parents' farm. Uh, had he been discovered, he would have been sent off to a labor camp. Uh, and so one night, Ort was bicycling past the Van der Hulst place, and he had a flat tire. And he was uh, being exposed at that time, was not healthy, and so he pulled into the barn, just went into the barn to fix his tire. And young Hank Van der Hulst came out to see what was going on, and he and Ort had a conversation. I guess Van der Hulst had been a physics student, and um, I'm told that the patches for tires in those days were very specific. You roughed up the tire, you put the glue on, you put the patch on, and you waited 10 minutes. And then nobody ever waited the full 10 minutes, but Ork was a very meticulous guy. And so he waited the full 10 minutes. And while he was waiting, he engaged in conversation with Van der Holst and said, uh, what you working on? Hey, here's an interesting thing. Why don't you find a spectral line in the radio wavelengths? 
So Van Hulst went off and did that. And this is a recreation of his colloquium that he held in life, where he announced the results of his uh, calculations and decided that there should be a line with a wavelength of 21 centimeters from neutral atomic hydrogen. Now, I was curious as to why there was no real record of this colloquium and why we have a reproduction until I realized this was incredibly illegal under Nazi occupation. And had the group been found, they all would have been hauled away. I think of that when I, when I complain about having to get up at three o'clock in the morning to observe. Um, Doc Ewan was a graduate student at Harvard. This is the horn that discovered the 21 centimeter line. We've got it outside. Ewan was here a few years ago. And uh, there was no agreement on the brightness of this line or whether it should even be an emission or absorption. So Ewan's task was to come up with a, a good upper limit um, that could um, then at least be something. He had a job on an, in industry. And so he was just waiting to finish his PhD. Um, and so they built this horn, stuck it out of the second or third floor of the physics building at Harvard. And he said he came back from lunch one day um, in the winter to see a bunch of junior fa physics faculty down below trying to throw snowballs up into his home. And the, uh, his comment was, the faculty can smell a failed experiment <laughs> from a mile away. But it wasn't a failed experiment. They discovered it. And they held up publication until it could be replicated in the Netherlands and in Australia. Because Ord and the gang were working with, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Let's see, this may be this. Um, yeah, I'll show you a picture in a minute. Ord and the gang were working with a surplus German radar antenna, and they had a fire that was destroyed some of their equipment, otherwise they would have discovered it. But it was an amazing uh, uh, example of harmony in science where the three papers appeared in the same issue of nature, bang, bang, bang. And the Dutch, in fact, even did an interpretation in terms of the rotation of the Milky Way. We now know there's hydrogen in every direction in the sky. This is a, a, an image of uh, hydrogen and velocities associated with the Milky Way and the Magellanic clouds. Our companion galaxies. This shows Orton van der Holst years later, and Doc Ewan standing by his horn outside the lab on the 50th anniversary of the discovery. We held a symposium here. This is one of the radar dishes at Pudfike, 1952, and Orton and the group outfitted this with a receiver and basically mapped the Milky Way. Within a year or two of the discovery of hydrogen we had a new understanding of where the center of the Milky Way was based on the rotation. It was just so revolutionary those first few years. Meanwhile, down in Australia, same time, this is, I believe, an 11 meter antenna that was built and repurposed for hydrogen work. And Ort got funds to build a 25 meter telescope. That's about 85 feet. A Dwingalo that's still there for a year. It was the biggest radio telescope, biggest telescope of any kind in the world. And with this mesh, it was had good performance at the 21 centimeter line and made all sorts of wonderful discoveries. Um, the radio astronomy tradition in the Netherlands continued with the Westerbork array. This is an array of, again, 25 meter dishes optimized for neutral hydrogen work, I think five gigahertz and below. That was just decommissioned last year, I believe. In Australia, I mean, this was a time when people were trying all, the problem as you know with radio astronomy is angular resolution. Okay, angular resolution is wavelength over diameter. If your wavelength is large, you need a big diameter in order to get good angular resolution. Here's one solution, the Mills cross. It's a bunch of dipoles in a row like this that you phase them up to get a very narrow beam in the north-south direction but of course the dipole has a big fat beam east-west. But you multiply it by signals from a dipole at 90 degrees angle that has the opposite characteristics and you can form a rather small beam on the sky. And most of the work done by uh, things like this and this were from the uh, continuum looking at non total continuum. This is the cross, the, I mean the Bird Franklin array in the mid 1950s built on a farm on the Potomac River, just upstream from Washington, DC. Um, 2,000 foot arrays uh, at 22 megahertz discovered that there were radio bursts from Jupiter. There we had this mysterious signal 
that didn't seem to follow the stars, didn't seem to follow what their tractors were, tractors were doing on the local farm, but ended up being from non-thermal emission from Jupiter. And the John Will Bank dish, the first of the modern big dishes uh, built in um, outside Manchester, England. Uh, the work of one guy, Sir Bernard Lovell, really, he almost went to jail for it. Um, and it was finished in 1957. Um, you have Manchester in England, and you have Cambridge in England. And those were the two sites of radio astronomy. And you might as well be talking about the Berlin Wall between them. They, they were uh, fighting over many, many things. It was, it's amazing to see such an animosity in such a small area. <laughs> but uh, they were building interferometers at Cambridge. And this shows the one that was responsible for what's called the third Cambridge catalog, the 3C. You'll run into sources labeled 3C all over the sky, and they are bright, almost all active galactic nuclei. And uh, this was a, each of these is a segment of a parabola, and then you string a lot of them together to get some angular resolution in the other direction. Again, working at fairly low frequencies in the hundreds of megahertz. Um, 25 meter telescopes, this is 26 meter in Penticton. This is a valley in the Okanagan River Valley uh, in British Columbia. And they started basically a green bank of Canada out there that's still active and flourishing. And I'll show another photograph of that. So you can see this, we're now in 1961. The observatory here, oh yes, Parkes Telescope, 1961, still active, 210 feet in diameter. Solid interior panels, mesh outside, but still quite active. The National Science Foundation was founded uh, in the days following World War II, when it was understood that it was the technological prowess of the United States that allowed the Allies victory. Um, and we tend to think of that in terms of the atomic bomb, but it was really thought at the time more radar, that radar was the key. And at that time, there was no mechanism for the federal government to support basic research. And there was a proposal actually by a senator from West Virginia that there should be a National Science Foundation to support pure research, not necessarily connected to defense. Um, it took many years to get that going. A big reason being that it would be required that federal money be given out to individuals or groups or universities decided not by Congress individually on grants, but devolving that authority to a group of scientists at the National Science Foundation. This was a kind of a constitutional crisis. Uh, could people who were not elected officials give out government money? And I bring this up now because this is under attack now. Um, and if you've read about a, a case uh, about the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, making rules about pollutants. Um, the Supreme Court decided that uh, rules like this should be explicitly stated by Congress and that power not devolve to scientists. So some um, jurists I know who are very high up in the judicial system are concerned that this is gonna boomerang back in a, in a big way over wide areas of science. Um, but the National Science Foundation was eventually founded in the mid 1950s. And one of the first things they realized was that radio astronomy was just the kind of thing that they were founded for. Radio astronomy would require large instrumentation in special sites, maybe instrumentation that could not be supported by any single university or even a consortium of universities. And so they found Green Bank, created the National Radio Quiet Zone, which is extremely important. Um, you talk about things that are under threat, wow. Um, and started building telescopes here. Now, it's an interesting fact that when the group of scientists that were assembled here were tasked with understanding what a national laboratory should be since there were no the national laboratories. And so with the 85 foot telescope, the Tatel telescope down the road there was the first public telescope, I believe in the world. Before that time, individual institutions had telescopes. And if you were part of the institution, you got time. If you weren't, you did not, or you had to make some deal to get time. This was a telescope where 
it was the science that would drive access. And so from the start, all uh, any scientist that wanted to could just write a brief proposal and they would the telescope would be scheduled competitively. And that included scientists working at NRAO at Green Bank. Uh, if you wanted time on the telescope, you had to compete with everybody else. And that was a new concept in the world. And the other thing was, it didn't respect international boundaries. It didn't matter where you were from. And that's now come to be called open skies. And so open skies started here in Green Bank. We take it for granted now that for example, big NASA telescopes like Webb, anybody can get time on Webb, right? And NASA has picked that up, but it wasn't always that way. Well, it was, it's complicated with NASA, but certainly the VLA, so it's complicated and it certainly was not all that way. It's not that way with ALMA. And it's, that is something that we may watch disappear in our lifetimes because it is so contentious um, when you have a closed instrument on one hand and people from there competing with time with an open instrument, <coughs> the instruments of NRAO. Stay tuned, it wasn't always that way. Uh, the first really significant, no, I shouldn't say that, the 85 telescope did a lot of great stuff but it was just a 85 foot telescope, 25 meter. Um, the staff got together here and built the 300 foot telescope in kind of record time, uh, 23 months, I think, from conception to first light. And it was built cheaply out of parts that were readily available. And you can see here, this uh, photograph of a very simple rib and hoop construction on a square box. Um, it was the first radio telescope that got good enough angular resolution in the 21 centimeter line to allow dark matter to be discovered in galaxies. Um, around the same time, this instrument, the Arecibo dish, was being built uh, by the Air Force uh, for ionospheric studies, was turned over to the National Science Foundation and began its lifetime as a very significant, I'll talk about that later, uh, instrument. And then in the 1964, the 140 foot was completed at Green Bank. Um, Cambridge by this time had a one mile telescope. These again, 25 meter class dishes spread out over a mile baseline. And in France, they tried something very completely different, a dual reflector. But see, the problem is always you've got, you want something that's big, but you need to hold it up against gravity. You need to hold it up against the wind and the rain and the elements. You want to tilt it around. Structural problems left and right. Here, big flat mirror. This is meant a couple hundred meters across. I, I should know that. And so signals will come down, get reflected off the flat mirror to a segment of a parabola here, and then to the receiver, which is right here. And so this allows you to steer up and down in the sky with the um, tilted part without you know moving it left and right. This part is uh, stationary and the receiver can move a little bit left and right, give you some tracking capabilities. That's now come to life as a pulsar, uh, reborn as a pulsar instrument. Um, this was an array at 85 megahertz, built for one purpose, uh, a lot of area. And this is the graduate student that used it to discover pulsars, Jocelyn Belkin. It had been occurred to people early on that you build these interferometers and you collect them by wires. But since we have heterodyne techniques and can actually record not just the amplitude of the incoming signal, but the phase as well, there's no reason why you can't record the signal at one station and then play it back against the signals at other locations and synthesize a telescope whose aperture is the distance between those stations. This is something that's really uh, unique in astronomy is our ability to do that. To, you know, many, you know, the, the CCD in your camera detects power from the photon, okay? X rays detecting power, calorimeters detect power, but we're detecting not just power, but amplitude and phase, which means we have the complete information and then can combine it. And so in the 1960s, there were experiments, a really amazing one between Green Bank and the Crimea. Um, you may have heard of the Crimea, yeah. Um, and uh, was pioneered in Canada, but then has developed now into a number of, of radio arrays. The 300 foot telescope made a lot of sky surveys. And this is an example of one of these 
Um, this is Green Bank here with the 300 foot telescope, Little Mountain, and all of the different kind of objects that were detectable with it. And most of those little, everything that looks like a point source on here is, is a point source and is real and is an active going to the gates. So the 300 foot worked well. It was designed for just a few years. And in its 26th year, a visiting astronomer took this photograph of it on November 15th, 1988. And he returned the next morning to take that photograph. It had collapsed during the night during normal operations on a calm, windless night. Um, pretty remarkable, pretty shocking. Uh, that's how it used to look coming up from the south towards Green Bank. Um, you learned if you were coming up from the south and you saw a car in front of you with out of state plates, you gave them a lot of birth when they came over this hillside because that's what they were going to see. Okay, that led to, oh, here I should say, uh, these were three users of the uh, 300 foot telescope. Mort Roberts, who uh, I kind of apprenticed with, he was working at radio wavelengths and discovering that the hydrogen around galaxies was much more extensive and uniformly rotating than could be accounted for by visible matter. And he, that was the discovery of dark matter. At the same time, his colleague and friend, Vera Rubin, with her colleague, Kent Ford, were working in the optical. Kent had built a photomultiplier tube that really allowed spectroscopy done on much more sensitive levels than before. And Vera was mapping out the H2 regions in the disks of galaxies and discovering again, the rotation could not be understood without a large component of dark matter. And so to my mind, the three of those were the discoverers of dark matter in the modern sense. Um, Vera died a few years ago. Ken just died in June. And Mort is still with us. Um, and that was a triumph of the 300 foot certainly. Uh, Germany was not far behind. That's a 100 meter telescope in a sort of valley of sorts in Eppelsburg, Germany. And of course, the Green Bank Telescope that's right down the valley here. Let me mention something about the design considerations for these telescopes. Parabolic reflector. Okay, it's the nature of the parabola of symmetry that an incoming plane wave is brought to a single focus. And what that means is that these distances here and here are the same. Now you see the problem with a symmetric parabola is that if you, it's one thing to bring them incoming signal to a focus, you've got to uh, put a receiver there. And so that is right in the middle of your aperture. You have to put some receivers, you have to put some legs, hold it up. And so you'll end up with a lot of blockage. Um, blockage, yes. And here's the problem with blockage that I use. You know, if you get, if you get light, I mean, if rain on your car window during the daytime when there's plenty of light, it's inconvenient, but you can still see what's going on. But at night, it's just impossible. Any strong signal that comes from off the side can be reflected into your receiver through these multi-path scattering. And in fact, I show this particular image because it's a kind of funny scandal that a new source of radio emission was detected with the Parkes radio telescope a few years ago that ended up being from a microwave in their uh, visitor center. So it's good if you can eliminate the blockage. I mean, blockage obviously blocks signal so you get less gain, but also having this kind of extraneous signal from the hot ground increases the system temperature and so on. Um, so here's what you can do. Any segment of that parabola reflects to the same focal point. Okay. So you don't have to build the whole thing. You can build something like that. And that's the Green Bank Telescope. The big arm here is entirely out of the optical path, which is coming from this direction. You can take another segment of that paraboloid, like that, and you'll build the horn reflector, as they're called, where you can build completely <coughs> surrounded by metal, and the incoming signal is then reflected to the point. There used to be a lot of these around the country for microwave transmissions. 
But here was a famous one. Um, NASA sent up this big 40 meter, I think, aluminized mylar balloon. You get the scale of it there from the people at the bottom. And the object was to transmit a signal from Earth to this, do I have the year on here? I don't remember, it's the early 60s, I think. Um, the, it would come back and be able to be received on Earth. Of course, if you know anything about optics, this is the wrong kind of mirror. You know, this is a mirror that scatters instead of focuses. But it was done. And in order to uh, maximize the sensitivity for this, they built a horn reflector at Bell Labs in Holmdale, New Jersey, which, um, as you could see, is that segment of a parabola. And because it's completely unblocked and completely enclosed, it has extremely precisely determinable properties. You know exactly what the radiation is that's coming in this horn. And that's why when these guys found an excess radiation, they understood after a year or two <laughs> that it was coming from uh, the Big Bang. And this was the telescope used to discover the Big Bang. And it was its unique unblocked properties that uh, allowed them to do that. Yeah, this is the paper, a measurement of excess antenna temperature at 408 omega hertz. You know, the, the titles of papers those days couldn't be more boring. Remember, remember Reber's, it was cosmic static, but uh, it did the job. Um, you've heard a bit about the very large array in New Mexico, 27, 25 meter dishes spread out over a very flat area. This is its most compact configuration. The individual antennas can be moved. Um, and this is the basic design. Um, I think this is, I can't remember which array this is. Uh, it has to be the most, that has to be the most extended one. But the way arrays like this work is you can combine the signal from any two points. And that gives you, in this case, this is, now we're looking north. So most of your baseline is north, but there's a little bit to the east. And so this will give you an interferometer that has good angular resolution along that line, but in the other direction, the angular resolution just of a 25 meter telescope. So um, it looks something like that. That would be the uh, beam pattern of these two telescopes that has strong side lobes since you only have two telescopes. And then you look at another pair and that's mostly to the west and a little bit to the north the vector here. And so that gives you a beam pattern that looks like that. And so you're seeing now that if you combine all of these different baselines together, all of these different patterns, everything cancels out except something very nice in the middle. And here is a snapshot of those different baselines that you get from this array at any instant. You know, there's a point here that comes from maybe this and this, uh, a lot of different um, baselines available instantaneously. And then as the earth rotates, viewed from above, this whole pattern rotates and sweeps out lines like that, which then fully cover a whole range of spacings in both dimensions. And that gives you really good, good angular resolution and good dynamic range. This is in its most spread out configuration. Uh, close up of an antenna. This is an antenna being moved. Extraordinarily productive. We also have the very long baseline array, which started in the um, early 1990s. And this is 10 antennas spread from Hawaii to St. Croix, operated by NRAO. <coughs> Let me apologize right now. I should have at the start to say this is very focused on instruments that I'm mostly familiar with. I'm not doing justice to what's happening in the rest of the world. Millimeter astronomy got started out behind the Jansky lab here by some of the scientists in the early days. They said, well, you know, what would, what would you be able to see at a wavelength of three millimeters at 100 gigahertz? And the thought was, well, going back to the Planck curves, you should be able to see the planets, maybe that's it. And so they started experimenting and built a small millimeter a dish um, here at Green Bank and ran it for a while and realized you really needed to get up above most of the atmosphere. And so this was a 36 foot dish 
uh, at uh, Kitt Peak, the uh, optical observatory in Arizona. It's not got a great elevation uh, by modern standards, but it did the job. And it was a weird thing. This is a single piece of aluminum, 36 feet across. And so you can imagine the thermal distortions that happen when sunlight hit this. So it had to be in a dome and you had to be very careful about that. Nonetheless, it was the right instrument at the right time. And it turned out that there are enormous numbers of interstellar molecules that were not known to be in space. In fact, the theory said they could not exist uh, that uh, emit very strongly at the millimeter wavelengths. And this was the right telescope built for the wrong reasons at the right time and had a, and given access uh, and discovered all sorts of uh, wonderful things. This is a curious telescope because it's small, 1.2 millimeters, but very good surface, mounted on the top of the physics building at Columbia University in Manhattan. During the winter, there's good atmosphere at places like Manhattan. You wouldn't believe at three millimeters. And uh, this was accessible to a number of generations of uh, graduate students. Um, I don't think it's an operating anymore. It was moved to Cambridge. Um, and at those, during those days, there was very little uh, interference at three millimeters. Uh, even so, even in downtown Manhattan, the sky was pretty dark all the time. I think they're looking at HCN now. HCN from yeah. Cambridge. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, I want to give a, a shout out to efforts uh, around the world. In India, they had an array of 40 meter hat, an array of 40 meter dishes that you can see it's pretty coarse mesh. Um, and so it was very good in the 21 centimeter line and working at longer wavelengths. I'm gonna go very quickly now. Um, 30 meter telescope, millimeter wavelengths, European consortium, still quite active. It's being upgraded right now. Again, taking advantage of all that rich spectroscopy available in the millimeter lines. And the LMT, a joint University of Massachusetts, Mexican antenna on an extinct volcano outside of Pueblo, Mexico, where they're really, I've been there, there is really not much air. Um, and that's really finally getting going. It's a design by a German firm. Uh, and uh, it's working at 100 to uh, certainly above 350. Uh, gigahertz. Alma. Alma's now 10 years old. Hard to believe. An array in the Atacama Desert in Chile where there really, really, really is no air. And at this point, operating costs start to get significant uh, for anything where you really, uh, is, is not easy to get to and you need special uh, considerations for people to work there. But Alma is just a knockout. The largest uh, ground-based scientific <coughs> instrument ever built, I believe. Uh, certainly a telescope I've ever built. The most expensive thing for the National Science Foundation, again, I believe. Really working at the highest frequencies, the shortest wavelengths. Um, and this was one of the early discoveries of Alma. They were able to get the angular resolution to map dust disks around forming stars and planetary systems. So these are planetary systems under formation. I think you know, it could be a whole a whole course, a whole week on Alma. And there's an array, N stands for Northern because this is intended to be a Northern counterpart to Alma. Um, I believe it's French-German collaboration that's working up in the Alps. Oh, oh gosh, I got to, I'm fast in China. This is a 500 meter diameter spherical reflector that is just now starting to kick butt in the karst region of China. It's an audacious thing, and it's comparable to the light lamented Arecibo telescope, but differs in an interesting way. Um, I'll show you some construction pictures of FAST. It's really hard to believe. It's made of, the surface is made of these triangular segments like this. Each triangular segment is flat. And that gives you an idea of the size of the triangular segment. There's a worker center, okay? Big, flat triangular segments. But it's good enough spread out over a half a kilometer to make a circular aperture. And that's a view from the side. Now, at Arecibo, the problem with a circular reflector is that it doesn't reflect to a point, it reflects to a line. 
And so at Arecibo, they had this 25 meter secondary here in a dome and then a tertiary to correct the optics. Complicated, heavy structure suspended above the dish. With FAST, they do a different thing. They move the dish, they bend the dish. The dish is mounted on hydraulic panels that have a range of like a meter or so. And at the segment in which the receiver is looking, they bend it into a parabola. And that parabola then moves around the surface. So they have a relatively light receiver up here that's illuminating an area down here, and they pull on that until they get a parabola that's pointed in the right direction. It took a while for them to get this working, but it is now working, and FAST is just pouring out beautiful, beautiful results. More FAST pictures. Okay, I'm gonna skip quick to, to the future. Oh, except Penticton. Yeah, Penticton, um, they built this telescope. It's uh, cylindrical paraboloids. We've got a piece of one down here that's just starting working. And this was, which is 80 meters by 100 meters and is a great light bucket. It's fixed, but the sky goes by. They phase up dipoles to get detections in a number of directions. And it's the right instrument built for the wrong reason to discover fast radio bursts. It's transformed our understanding of fast radio bursts. I don't know whether it's ever going to do. Um, the H stands for hydrogen in China. I don't know whether it's ever going to do hydrogen, but it has been a wonderful instrument for fast radio bursts. And so we are involved in some work with them, a small fast outrigger down here. And then there'll be other dishes. Um, this array of small dishes here in Green Bank that will be now uh, you, uh, moved up by the fast piece and used as a complement to do interferometry. Okay, I got to show the Event Horizon Telescope. You've all heard about this. This is M87, the galaxy, half of black and nuclei. You can see a little bit of a jet here. Um, and that's its black hole image by a array of radio telescopes operating at uh, very high frequencies. I believe it was 230 gigahertz that did this uh, from the South Pole to Greenland. Okay, future, future. I'm supposed to do the future in 10 minutes. Future, as you all know, is a wrapper out of Atlanta. <laughs> he hit the scene with Pluto, his first album in 2012. He's won two Grammys since then and um, is really a force to be reckoned with. Um, the future of radio astronomy is a couple of very big projects and a number of other projects. I can't do justice to any of them now. Um, square kilometer array is envisioned as two different instruments. One, low frequencies, hundreds of megahertz and below at the Australia, in the Australian desert, uh, north, east of Perth, the very western part of Australia. And the other part, um, that's ASCAP, that's an array that currently exists there. But the other part of the uh, square kilometer array is envisioned to be 133 15 meter dishes of this kind of design. That's a photograph of the existing Meerkat array, which is a South American, South African array, um, and has something like 64 of these dishes, 15 meter dishes, and that will be expanded to 133, covering this area in the Karoo Desert in South Africa. That is happening. Uh, the United States is not part of this, but there is an international consortium which is raising money to fund that. That is going to work up to about 10 gigahertz, I think. In the United States, there's work on the next generation VLA. And here's a kind of imagining of where its antennas might be located, scattered out around New Mexico, all the way down into Mexico with a core that looks like this. And then these arms going out, these are all on different scales. This is a half a kilometer here. This is 400 kilometers here. We'll have some of these at Green Bank to do very well baseline interferometry. Oh yeah, there, that shows where the next generation VLA. Funding for this seems to be going okay. You can never know until uh, you get the money in the bank. But so far we have money for design development. And there's even a prototype antenna. Um, this antenna 
And I'd be happy to talk about the wonderfulness of this design. Uh, when you're building hundreds of things, you have different criteria than when you're only building one. And it costs money to get these little fragments of panels here, which are so different than the rest of the panels that give you a smooth edge. So you ask, do we really need a smooth edge? And that's the kind of thinking, creative thinking that's going into the NGBLA. There's some radio astronomy in space. This is very expensive, but space is very expensive. This is the Radio Astron Russian 10 meter telescope that ceased operation just a few years ago. And papers are still coming out from it. Uh, we were very involved in all aspects of this, including downlink and doing VLB with this antenna. Um, there should be a talk coming up in the next month or two about radio astron results in our bi-weekly series. Just to give you an idea of relative sizes, this is the biggest radio telescope in space at 10 meters. That's the size of Hubble, okay? So it really is expensive to put things in space. And this is an interesting experiment to try to look at the epoch of recombination, very high redshift at hydrogen, very low frequencies, requires that you, there's no place on earth that really is really quiet enough uh, from uh, human interference. And so this is designed to go behind the moon and to use the moon as a shield to uh, make measurements of the very faint signals uh, from the time when the uh, universe was neutral and then got ionized by the first generation of quasars. I'm going to end there, kind of frantic and out of breath. I'm sorry I had to rush the end part because there's so much more that can be said by any of this, but I'll be around all week, happy to chat, except for tomorrow when I'm going to see the Barbie movie. Uh, happy, happy to chat about any of these things and uh, over lunch or whatever. My office is on the second floor with a chance to do that. Welcome to Green Bank. Um, I hope you uh, find what you're keen to look for. Thanks. Thank you. Time for a few questions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, at one point, you had mentioned that I forget the name, but someone built a telescope in Manchester, and he almost went to jail for it. Yeah. And I'm just kind of wondering about the backstory on that. It had to do with the funding for it. He was spending money that he was not authorized oh. to spend, and that's a, an interesting point. This was 1957, and things were coming to a crisis there. And all of a sudden, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik for a satellite. And there was this new thing in the sky. And Drago was perfectly positioned to track it. And overnight, he became a hero. Again, it was a case of the thing being in the right place at the right time. He's written, uh, Bernard, Sir Bernard Lovell has written several books about Drago back to Great fun to read. But you should not do that. Do not spend money. You know. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, about the Chinese fast telescope, yes. but they actually use to, to observe a certain direction. They actually use a small fraction of the entire surface. That's correct. Yes, they're using a couple hundred meters of the five hundred meters. But the 500 meters then gives them a, a big sky coverage. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Why did they build it spherically instead of a parabolic dish to begin with? Well, the parabolic fixed on the ground only has one point, it only looks up. So you have, to, you have to move the whole parabola. Yeah. So this, the spherical dish is the cheapest mm -hmm. way of getting a lot of collection. But then you have the problem co um, collecting the signal. Yeah. Let me just point to something very quick here on fast because uh, it's fast is amazing. I was there a few years ago. Can we see this? Let's see. Nah, it's it's they have a smooth edge. So they have built special panels to go around the edge to make it smooth. And that I think was totally aesthetic. 
I don't think it makes a bit of difference to the performance. Well, we've got to go. Oh, yes. For, so for the NGBLA, you talked about how because they're accounting for hundreds of you know dishes, mm -hmm. and so they can't have like those nice smooth edges. And so yesterday we talked about how with these telescopes, you can't always get to the, like you can't observe to the edges of the, the dishes right. themselves. So them, the, like the, these angled edges that it might overlap into it or something like that. I missed the very last part of the part. Oh, like so because the NGBLA, like the prototypes, have like the sharp edges. Yeah. Does that mean, does that account? Like, yeah, will that affect any of this kind of like mm, observable? It doesn't have to, in the same way that the GBT's ragged edges don't. Because in fact, you the, the illumination pattern will probably be like this. It'll probably, it'll be a circular illumination pattern. And so it really doesn't matter that it goes out there. But this really design cuts down on the number of the independent panels that you have to make, the number of independent panel molds and things like that. And that multiplied by 133 really, or 214, yeah, really adds up in cost. Yes. How large? What would shift the typical size of the focal plane of such telescopes? Ah, in meters. In meters. You know, I don't know for these. I would guess that, so for example, on the GBT, um, at three millimeters, the size of the focal plane is about a meter. And so you could put a thousand independent feeds there. And it scales with wavelength. Um, of course, you get some drop off in performance as you go out. Yeah, because I mean, one issue of parabolic mirrors is the comma. Yes. You see off axis. Yes. So I imagine, I, I was supposing that the top plane is quite small. No, it, it doesn't have to be because these are such long FODs for going to diameter. So um, I, don't, I don't think you get, I remember the number for three millimeters and it's about a meter. And um, uh, at that point, you start getting coma that's no more than uh, a few percent, maybe five percent. So, yeah, these are all design considerations that go into building. Do one more quick question. It's a, okay. okay, great. Not counting any of the telescopes here, what's your favorite telescope? <laughs> Who's your favorite cousin? <laughs> <laughs> I got to think about that, but um, and that's a, such an interesting question. But Parks is so funky; um, it groans when the wind blows, and you're inside it, uh, and there's always the danger of a snake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll come. I'll, I'll think about that. Some more. Great. Thank you very much, Jay, for a great talk.